done. It's been I'm Margaret Brennan, and welcome to Facing Forward. Even if you're not a parent, getting kids back into classrooms is key to reviving America's economy. We could see an entire cohort of kids with a lower lifetime earnings because they're deprived of another semester of school. Millions of parents, uh, are, particularly moms, are forced to stay home, reducing the family wages. One major problem? Virtual learning from kitchen tables simply doesn't work. Remote learning is failing too many of our kids. We have to think about their present, but also their future. But as COVID-19 continues to swirl in communities, there seems to be no end in sight for more than half the students in the country. Ahead, a conversation with Sal Khan, founder of the Khan Academy, a digital learning nonprofit known for its online educational tools for students worldwide. We'll take a closer look at the race to get America's children caught up after a lost year and what the future looks like for remote learning. Podcasting in a pandemic means we sometimes encounter the occasional technical difficulty. And that was the case this week. We're ironing them out for our next episode. But for now, here's my conversation with Sal Khan. Thanks for joining us from California today. Great to be here. So I read you were raised by a single mom who worked as a 7-Eleven cashier in Louisiana, and you were rocking math competitions as a high schooler. So you went on, as smart kids often do, to some pretty prestigious universities. You went on and worked as a hedge fund analyst. So how did you go from that to this nonprofit business of online school tutorials? Yeah, that's, like I say, a reasonable synopsis of the first 30 or so years of my life. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, in two sentences, in two your sentences life. it's pretty good. Um, the, you know, my, my original background out of undergrad was in technology and in and, and software. And then after business school, as you mentioned, I ended up working in finance. Uh, but I've always had this interest in education. In 2004, I was a year out of business school. I was working at a hedge fund in Boston. I had just gotten married. And my family from New Orleans was visiting for the wedding, and uh, it just came out of conversation that my 12-year-old cousin, Navia, was having trouble with math. And so I was convinced that I, I might be able to help her, and so she agreed to take my tutoring. So she goes back to New Orleans. I start remote tutoring her, and it was unit conversion that she was having trouble with. And you know, first I had to overcome her lack of confidence, but once we got past that, she got unit conversion, she got caught up with her class, she got a little ahead of her class, and that same Nadia who was put into a remedial math track was then put into an advanced math track. So I was hooked, I started tutoring her younger brothers, word spreads in my family that free tutoring is going on, and <laughs> before I know it, uh, 10, 15 cousins, family, friends from around the country, every day after work, I was, I was getting on the phone, trying to communicate online with them. You know, that I called it Khan Academy almost as a joke because it was like me and my cousins. And uh, then a, about a year later, now 2006, uh, a friend said, well, how are you scaling your lessons? And his name's Zuli Ramzan, have to give him full credit. And I said, Zuli, you're right. It's much harder to do with 15 cousins what I was doing just with Nadia. And he said, well, why don't you record some of your lessons to complement your software, uh, record them as videos on YouTube, and then your cousins can access them whenever they want. And I initially thought it was a horrible idea. I said, Zuli, uh, YouTube is for cats playing piano. It is not for mathematics. Uh, but I gave it a shot. And, you know, my, I told my cousins, I'm going to make these videos on things that you, you know, I feel like I have to answer a lot or review a lot. Uh, but then when we get on the phone, we can dig deeper. And after about a month, uh, I asked for feedback. They famously told me they liked me better on YouTube than in person. Uh, it soon became clear that people who were not my cousins were watching. And so between the software and the videos, it started taking on a life of its own. And by 2009, there was about 100,000 folks using it every month. And then that's when, frankly, I had trouble focusing on my day job. And uh, I, I, I set Khan Academy up as a not-for-profit, pretty convinced that, look, the social return on investment here is off the charts. Uh, surely some philanthropists will recognize that. And so with that kind of delusional optimism, <laughs> I, 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 I took the leap and quit my day job and you know, 2009 was a tough year because uh, the, the world doesn't always conspire the way you think it will. We were living off of savings and, you know, our first child had just been born. But by uh, mid-2010, we got our first real philanthropic funding and 
uh, Khan Academy was able to become an organization. So fast forward, you've now kind of become like the poster child for remote learning, which is interesting because now we're in the midst of, as a country, figuring out how to educate kids at home. And, and for people who aren't parents and don't have kids and might think this is all, you know, not important to them, I, I think one of the big challenges for our country right now has been laid bare that, that you can't get the U.S. economy chugging along until you can get parents fully back in the economy. And that's in large part dependent on getting their kids back into school but it's also going to mean getting their kids back up to speed. So that's why I want to dig into you kind of like the bigger picture here. Um, why do you think when people are at home and listening to what's going wrong with our education systems right now, that the impression is remote learning does not work? Well, as you mentioned, as, as someone who is, I guess, sometimes viewed as a poster child for online learning, which sometimes gets combined with remote learning, I'll be the first to say that if I had to pick for myself or my own children or anyone else's children between an in-person amazing teacher, if I had to pick between that and the fanciest distance learning online, artificial intelligence, I would pick the in-person human amazing teacher every time. So I'll be the first to say that uh, you know pure online or distance learning is a, it cannot be a substitute for an amazing in-person uh, teacher. Now, with that said, even before COVID, we know that there's large parts of the planet, including a lot in the U.S., where you don't have uh, access to certain courses. You might not have access to a teacher that you're really resonating with. And that's where it is important to be able to raise the floor for students. And so that's where online learning, that's where Khan Academy, other resources, things like MOOCs can be valuable. But the ideal circumstance is where you're able to leverage tools to liberate or unlock what that amazing teacher can do. Now, what's happened with COVID is we've had a, a strange set of constraints uh, applied to us where uh, you're not able to get the best of both worlds. And it, and it's all happened super fast, so people didn't have a lot of time to plan. And so you had a kind of wholesale migration in a literally matter of days or weeks from in-person instruction to essentially video conference instruction. And, you know, the reality is, is, in-person instruction, there's ways to do it really well, and there's ways to do it not so well. And uh, the not so well has always been, you know, kids' fingers on lips, you know, passive, just listen to a lecture. It, that's usually not so engaging in person. And then when you transplant that onto video conference, it becomes that much less engaging because obviously kids can look at other windows. They don't have to show up. So yeah, it's it's comp it's very suboptimal on on so many levels. But it doesn't mean that online learning or distance learning is bad. It just means that these constraints that we're having are unfortunate. If we had COVID without the online learning or distance learning, then things would have been that much worse. What do you think is the hardest thing to teach via remote? Well, I think there's all of these intangibles that happen, and we all remember it from school. You know, all the things you you learned from your peers, some hard hard lessons uh, in the hallway, collaborating with people. Sometimes, you know, just a certain look that the teacher gets you, and you might get a little bit of that on a video conference, uh, but it's all of those, you know, implicit social emotional learning things. And, you know, what's especially been hard right now is this, this lifeline on video conference isn't just about academic learning because kids are also not able to socialize in the ways that they were before. Uh, and so that's leading to, I think, tough issues for a lot of kids. You know, I see with my kids on if two or three days go by where they're not able to at least, you know, see one friend in a play date in a COVID safe way at a park. And if they're inside for that day, they just kind of yeah. get a little, you know, batty. Um, and we're lucky, you know, I have a backyard. I live in a neighborhood and we live in Northern California. It's like 75 degrees outside right now. So we can do this. But I, you know, I can't imagine so many kids if you're living, frankly, if you grew up the way I grew up, you're growing up in a apartment complex where there's pretty much a lot of concrete outside. You're not in a place where it's easy to go outside. That's really, really tough when, you know, you have to do everything online. And, you know, for a lot of these families, they don't have a great internet connection, if, if any at all. Or what about parents who, you know, have to become teachers on the fly and, you know, turn their kitchen table into a classroom and, and they don't speak English? How, how do they teach their kids? Exactly. I mean, and, and I'll, you know, on top of that, what if they have to work like my mom did at the convenience store and uh, who's watching the kids? Uh, you know, I remember right. when I grew up, you know, me and my sister, we were in the 80s, they called the latchkey kids. You know, we, we would come home at two or three and, 
you know, kind of watch TV and my mom would come home at six or 7 PM and, and then, you know, we'd all have dinner together, but uh, it's incredibly difficult because in, in my, my circumstances, there's myself, my wife's a physician, but she's able been able to see some of her patients remotely during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother-in-law lives with us. Uh, so between all of us, we have a lot of support and they go to a school that was really supporting them uh, through this situation. And it was still hard. And so if you take all of that away, that's that's what all of us are afraid of. You know, I talked to, I have a school teacher who lives uh, two doors down from us. And she was saying, and this is in a upper middle class neighborhood, she's saying that here she's lost 10% of her kids. Like they just disengaged. They're not showing up for online learning. When they do, she sees that their their vocabulary has degraded because they just haven't been engaged in school. And this and the problem's a lot worse if you go to some rural areas or some r- urban areas where it's 20, 30% of kids really haven't been able to engage. So I think we have to make the best of the constraints that we have now. But as we start to get out of this COVID period, it really does have to be viewed as a disaster recovery project because these gaps that these kids are accumulating and this lack of self-esteem and what's hitting them socially and emotionally, this will have long lasting repercussions for, for decades if we don't if we don't try to fix it. Yeah, the um, I saw one figure that put it at an economic cost of between 14 to 28 trillion dollars to the U.S. Con- economy if schools remain closed for in-person learning. That was according to the OECD. I mean, that's pretty staggering about the long-term cost. But I, I want to talk to you about um, how to find some solutions because we've been admiring this horrible problem. Let's talk about how to fix it in a moment. So stay with us. So I live in Washington, D.C., and they gave out hot spots to kids and tech equipment to students so they can remotely learn. But in a lot of places in the country, you know, you can't even uplink to the Internet. According to the FCC, nearly 30 million Americans can't really benefit from the from the digital age. And it it really hits um, in rural areas in, in particular. So. It seems to me that's not just an education problem. What you're talking about in ways to try to fix the education system, it requires infrastructure overhaul in this country too, right? Absolutely. And what you just pointed to, exactly, it's not just an education issue. Just to engage in the economy, to look for a job, to stay in touch with friends and family, you need some form of internet access now. In urban areas, it's more of an affordability issue. In rural areas, it's just that the infrastructure oftentimes is not there. Now, the silver lining is I have never seen more energy behind this issue of the digital divide than we are seeing right now. So it's the last eight, nine months have been horrible for these families, these communities. It's been hard for them to engage. Uh, But people are taking this problem seriously. You know, I've talked to groups like SpaceX uh, who have obviously the Starlink, you know, where they're going to put a bunch of low Earth orbiting satellites and uh, hopefully be able to get Internet access to not just rural America, but, you know, rural everywhere. Um, and I'm feeling optimistic that in the next three to five years, this will, will, we won't completely solve this, but it'll be mitigated to a large degree. So your Khan Academy, you can access these tutorials for free. Some school districts do contract with you, I saw. But um, a lot of your benefactors here include like the Walton family. They are behind Walmart, Bank of America, Gates Foundation, Google. Do those benefactors influence the content that you post? No, not at all. Um, you know, these all of these foundations have always just been, I mean, you know, the Gates Foundation, for example, if we go back to that story in 2010 when I was trying to get funding, actually I was applying for a grant with the Gates Foundation for, for I think it was like $30,000. Um, and then it just came out of the woodwork that, that Bill himself was using Khan Academy with his children, and he himself was using it to learn some topics in finance and other really? things. Really? Um, <laughs> what was he trying to learn? So my understanding, well, his kids were using it for, to, for math and science. And then I believe he he really enjoyed, uh, back in 2008 and 2009, I actually made a whole uh, explanation of the financial crisis and what was happening. And I did that actually because my day job, I, want, I, I kept reading the Federal Reserve Act to understand all of the levers. And I was like, Wow, even the people on the news don't really understand this well. And so I started making explanations. Yeah. It actually turned out back in 2009, even some of the news anchors I later found out were watching the Khan Academy videos on credit default swaps and mortgage backed securities before <laughs> reporting on it. But, it, you know, that was a, a, an example of, uh, you know, once Bill became a fan and 
they kind of flew me up to Seattle and said, what's the vision here? And I said, look, the vision is let's make all of the core academic content available to anyone in the world, including in all the world's major languages. Let's make it as personalized and engaging as possible. And one day, let's see if we can figure out ways that we can connect that to opportunity and completely in line with, with what they believed. Um, and, you know, Bank of America, they cared about financial literacy, frankly, especially coming out of the financial crisis. And, you know, none of them have any editorial say. So you have this argument in Washington over uh, funding as part of an upcoming bill President Biden is trying to push through Congress. And, and some of the money in it, about $130 billion, is going to go for schools. Um, there's some money in it that's supposed to or could be used to play catch up over the summer with some kind of perhaps voluntary, you know, catch up program. I know the teachers union uh, had we spoke with recently, Randy Weingarten said that should be voluntary uh, to, to go to summer school. Um, what do you see on the horizon that can help fix the problems that you see right now? Yeah, and as you mentioned, I believe roughly 20 percent of that of that those funds are targeted at learning loss, uh, which is, you know, a very broad term for, and it could be learning loss that happened well before COVID, but the theory is, and there's data to, to back that up, that there's, that the learning loss or the unfinished learning has accelerated during COVID. And, you know, this is something that Khan Academy has always been focused on. When COVID hit, we saw our traffic increase by a factor of three. You know, we normally see about 30 million learning minutes per day. That went to about 85 million learning minutes per day. And we're, we've accelerated a whole series of content and resources to specifically address learning loss. So we've created new courses called Get Ready for Grade Level Courses, which cover all of the prerequisites you need to master in order to fully engage at the grade level courses. Uh, there's another not-for-profit that I started in response to COVID uh, that we think could play a huge role in this recovery effort, for lack of a better word, called schoolhouse.world, which is about giving free tutoring to people. We have high quality vetted volunteers. Some of these are, are retired professors, teachers. Some of these are software engineers and lawyers and doctors. And some of them are just really good high school students and college students uh, who are willing to tutor other folks. And that's picking up a lot of steam. We have the state of New Hampshire, state of Rhode Island, states of, and state of Mississippi that have already signed on to use it for all the tutoring in their state. So between the software content, personalized learning aspects on Khan Academy, and then what we, what we think we're creating is a national free tutoring platform on schoolhouse.world, uh, which could be used, and both of these things could be used outside of a classroom or as part of a formal school day. Uh, we hope to you know, be part of that, that solution to, to help fill in students' gaps. And who is that up to, though? I mean, does that ultimately just come down to a parent saying, my kid's got to play catch up? Or do you think these things need to actually be required by school districts? So... I think it's going to be a combination. I, I, in the ideal circumstance, I do. I would love both. In the ideal circumstance, every teacher knows about these resources. Uh, every parent knows about these resources and gets their students on it. You know, we see efficacy studies. If kids are even able to put in 40 minutes a week, it can dramatically accelerate them. Uh, but the ideal is if kids are able to put in 15, 20 minutes a day above and beyond what they would have normally done in school, especially mm -hmm. in topics like math. We have a lot of evidence that not only will they fill in their gaps, but they'll probably accelerate well ahead of their peers. Uh, so every parent should know that because these resources are free and, and, and available to, to everyone. Uh, you know, my understanding of how the money will flow is primarily going to, most of that money is going to go to the states. And then the state uh, kind of commissioners of education will distribute most of that money to the districts. And then the districts are going to have a lot of leeway in how they use it. Uh, you know, my, my hope is that they use that to create in-person settings so that there is that mentorship, that human connection that can then leverage some of these online tools, including online tutoring. So, I mean, remote, remote learning is going to stay with us. Um, and in fact, if you look at the CDC guidelines for reopening schools, the majority of schools are in areas with really high COVID rates. So that means under the guidelines that like middle school and high schools have to stay virtual only unless they can, you know, really strictly implement all the mitigation strategies. So for high school and middle grade students, is that sort of the area that you think is the greatest focus for you right now, since they seem to be kind of stuck online for the near future? I, I think it's all of the above. And I think we're, we're talking about two phases. We're talking about between now and 
hopefully things normalize by the fall, uh, what we're going to do. And our focus is on everyone from pre-K, we have Khan Academy Kids, which is reading, writing, math, and social emotional learning, uh, all the way through elementary, middle, high school, and early college. You know, we go into some of those, all of those early general ed, especially all of the STEM courses. And Mm -hmm. I think now it's a lot of science, technology, math. Right. And right now it's going to be, you're going to have to leverage the technology while the pandemic is, is going. But once we get back to school, so to speak, uh, there's going to be all of this gap filling. And that's where the extra tutoring from places like schoolhouse.world, you know, leveraging Khan Academy, ideally in a classroom uh, so that uh, kids can fill in their gaps while the class starts to move ahead to the appropriate grade level. Uh, I think that's going to be essential. Sal Khan, it's been good to talk to you today. Founder and CEO of Khan Academy, thank you for your time. Great. Thanks for having me. Starting this episode, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of the underreported stories worldwide. Overseas this week. Vittime del vile agguato. Cowardly and heartbreaking is how Italy's top diplomat described the deadly ambush that took the lives of Italy's ambassador to the Congo, Luca Atanasio, and two other people. The 43-year-old ambassador, his driver, and bodyguard were traveling on a humanitarian mission to visit a World Food Program school project, according to the UN. Their diplomatic convoy was attacked in the eastern Congo in an area home to a tangled web of dozens of armed groups. The death of the European diplomat turned a spotlight towards the violence in the DRC, where brutal attacks have displaced over 5 million people in what the UN calls one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. It's also a reminder of the dangers faced by peacemakers, the diplomats and humanitarian workers who do the hard work every day of reaching out to the communities in which they serve. Thank you for listening to Facing Forward. New episodes are available every Friday. Join us each week as we make sense of our changing world together. I'm Margaret Brennan. You can also find me on your CBS Network broadcast station Sunday mornings on Face the Nation or on our digital network CBSN at 10.30 a.m., 1 p.m., and 4 p.m. Sundays or through our CBS All Access app. Facing Forward is produced by Face the Nations and SHU, Richard Escobedo, and Kelsey Miklas, with research help this episode from Kamani Hayes. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. <laughs>